Uh, today's uh, webinar is very challenging. Uh, as I said, it talks about the uh, OBGYN training uh, during COVID-19. Of course, it concerns uh, uh, attendings, it concerns young physicians, it concerns OBGYN uh, in training. Uh, we have all suffered and faces, faced a lot of challenges in terms of our uh, hands-on training, in terms of attending meetings, attending workshops, uh, so on and so forth. I'm very happy uh, uh, today uh, to welcome uh, uh, WATOG uh, leadership and participants uh, to speak uh, about uh, and discuss uh, this uh, important uh, uh, topic. Uh, I want to thank, uh, uh, of course, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Adziri. I want to, to thank also uh, Goknur, uh, Chipo, and uh, Fabiano uh, for being uh, uh, and taking part uh, in this webinar. And I would like to introduce uh, Adziri, Dr. Adziri Ramirez Negren. Uh, she is the uh, WATOG uh, uh, president, which is the World Association of Trainees in Obstetric and Gynecology. Uh, Dr. Ramirez is an obstetrician gynecologist at Hospital Dr. Manuel Guilla Gonzalez uh, Pelvic Floor Clinic in Mexico City. Uh, she's involved in teaching medical students and trainees at several national hospitals and performs research focusing on education and pelvic uh, floor. Aziri, in your hands. Thank you very much, Professor Faisal. Thank you very much for the very nice um, introduction that you gave to our organization. I will talk just a little bit uh, about the WATOC for those of you who don't know it. The WATOC is the World Association of Trainees in Obstetrics and Gynecology, and our mission is to promote the foundation and the sustainment of OBGYN training associations at a national and regional level. We potentiate the involvement of OBGYN trainees at global issues, meaning about reproductive health care, the mother, fetus, and newborn, but also women's health care in general. We want to improve the education and training among obstetrics and gynecology trainees worldwide and we collaborate with the FIGO and other national and regional senior societies to improve the woman, women's health globally. So this uh, survey that we did and that now the results will be presented by my colleagues is a very important survey that took place during um, the, the, pandem the COVID pandemic. And it was very interesting because we were invited by somebody who is super enthusiastic, who is Professor Gogner, and she will present to us uh, the European findings. But let me present to you all, uh, all of today's speakers. Professor Chipo Wansura, she's an obstetrician and gynecologist at the University of Zimbabwe College of Health Sciences and Pararin to, to a group of hospitals in Harare, Zimbabwe. She's also a fellow at Fogarty UCGHI Glocal, and she's the current vice president of the WATOC. She's an early career researcher whose career goal is to contribute to finding solutions to reduce the burden of maternal mortality and mortality in Zimbabwe, so Saharan Africa, and globally. And this year, she is assessing the effective, effectiveness of tranexamic acid in preventing postpartum hemorrhage following cesarean section. Professor Gabnur Tapku, she is an obstetrics and gynecology specialist in the Turkish Ministry of Health. She's also a specialist in Rize Kakar State Hospital in Turkish Trainees in Obstetrics and Gynecology Board President. She is the president of the European Network of Trainees in Obstetrics and Gynecology, the ANTOC. She's also our ex part of our executive committee of Europe. Um, she's the European Board and College of Obstetrics and Gynecology Standing Committee of Training and Assessment member. And she's an advanced soft skills, soft skill trainer. Um, Professor Fabiano Elise is a representative of Latin America and Brazil for WATOC. He's also a professor of medicine and coordinator of the residency of OBGYN in Universidad Sao Caetano do Sul and coordinator of obstetrics at Hospital Maternidade Interlagos. So thank you very much to all of our speakers for being here with us. Um, we are very happy to be with you and we are very happy to all the attendees that are today here with us. So we will start with, Professor, with Dr. Gobner Topku, who will be presenting about the results of the survey in Europe. Thank you very much and welcome, Dr. Gobner. Thank you, Atsuri, for uh, such a great introduction. And I'd like to um, 
welcome all of the um, attendees to our webinar today. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with the education during the COVID-19 pandemic in Europe. Again, this is Gokner Topçu from Turkey. I'm the current president of European Network of Trainees in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, I would like to start by int introducing you what is NTOG. Uh, NTOG represents trainees and young specialists in Europe. It's a non-governmental, independent and non-profit association that was formed in 1997. And we collaborate closely together with EPCOG, which stands for European Board and College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Our core objectives are international working, um, harmonizing and improvement of quality of training and representing trainees and young specialists all over Europe. At the moment, we have 35 member countries, as you can see the list, and only uh, countries with national training associations can be presented in NTOG. This is our current executive, and me as a president, Agnieszka Horala from Poland as our secretary general, Haja Katak from UK as our treasurer, Manuel Henriquez from Portugal as our member, and Ferry Bokars from Netherlands as our member. Coming to activities, one of our uh, most exciting activity is the NTOG exchange that we do every year in a different uh, NTOG member country. Uh, two trainees from all of all member countries come together for a three-day hospital exchange followed by a scientific media, meeting and NTOG council. And even years is jointly together with the EPCOG Congress. And this year, the NTOG exchange will take place in Greece followed by the EPCOG Congress. And next year, NTOG exchange will be in Norway. We collaborate uh very closely together with these associations as you can see as i mentioned european board and college of obstetrics and gynecology epcoc is uh the association that we collaborate very closely together with uh and as i mentioned this year epcoc congress will take place in greece and also um a figo congress i would like to mention and thank again to the figo association for involving us in uh in the congress and it will be in October 2021 that will take place virtually. As Atsiri mentioned, NTOG is a part of WATOG. Uh, we represent Europe in the World Association uh, of Trainees in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And other than that, we work together very closely with ISIOG, with European um, Perinatal Medicine Association, with uh, Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology in Europe, and Sexual Health and Contraception in Europe. Other NTOG activities include one-to-one -one exchange, short-term fellowships, multi-center research where um, trainees can do research all uh, together in Europe, um, supporting national associations in their projects, and we're working together with EPCOG in health inequalities projects. Coming to today's webinars, uh, we do surveys in NTOG, and one of the surveys that we did uh, with the start of the pandemic last year is the influence of the COVID-19 outbreak on European trainees in obstetrics and gynecology is a survey to evaluate the impact uh, of training in obstetrics and gynecology in Europe. So COVID-19 in Europe, by the end of May this year, 169 million people, people reported to test positive for COVID-19. And in the EU, by the end of May, 32 million cases have been reported positive and 713 that uh, were reported. COVID-19 pandemic not only affected our personal life, but also our professional life. And the dis disruption of a training and um, caused a lot of uh, differences and it came up with a need of changes in the training program. So we did our survey to explore the challenges that our trainees are facing uh, during the pandemic and our aims were to investigate how the pandemic affected training uh, across Europe and how we can learn uh, from the strategies that were implemented. So we did a cross-sectional explorative survey using online questionnaire that was made of uh, 40 questions. And we subdivided this questionnaire into four subjects. For, part one was the workload. Part two was the specialist training aspects in obstetrics and gynecology. Part three was health and safety of trainees. And part four was women's health. Coming to translations, uh, our major um, original version of questionnaire was in English, but it was also translated to Turkish. And a third version was created uh, for WATOK, uh, World Association of Trainees in Obstetrics and Gynecology, which was additionally translated to Spanish. However, uh, the data collected in Spanish and Turkish was not used in the report that we've done uh, in Europe. 
And then after doing the data analysis, I'm going to uh, introduce you our report. Um, so we had 110 trainees across 25 countries who replied to the questionnaire and the mean age was 31. So looking at the year of training, 14 trainees uh, were in their first year, 22 in their second, 16 in the third, 17 in the fourth, 18 in the fifth, and 11 in the sixth year. And six other trainees reported to be in either sixth, seventh, and eighth year. Usually, uh, OBGYN training across Europe is five years. In some countries, it can differ from four to five, six, and seven. So coming to the workload, um, apart from what we have been thinking, uh, we have realized that the outcome uh, that tr most of the trainees of workload decreased during the first wave of COVID-19 pandemic in Europe. Our trainees replied that saying they had 60% 60 per, uh, 60 said that they worked less hours than usual. And 68% thought the hospital related workload decreased. But 9% nine, nine of our trainees reported that, uh, that they had increased in their working hours. And some trainees uh, reported that even though the hospital and patient related workload decreased, but overall workload felt increased because of the stress factors that they were facing during the pandemic. And working from home was introduced to many trainees across Europe. 38% of trainees spent at least some part of their training uh, working hours uh, from home. And 19% of uh, trainees reported reported 20 hours or more of work from home per week. Um, looking at the other part, 5% of our trainees deployed on special COVID-19 units. And a trainee from UK said that they were completely redeployed in an intensive care unit uh, during the pandemic. We also asked about the resting hours if they had enough time to uh, rest during this pandemic and 52% reported that they had adequate time to rest while they're at work. And 76% reported they had enough time to rest after work. Uh, but looking at other side, 22% uh, were expected to be on standby continuously for 24 hours a day and seven days a week for unscheduled duties, including on calls. Due to this reason, we believe 9% of our trainees felt they were overworking and 10% felt burnt out. As I mentioned, some trainees had to be on standby 24 seven and 29% uh, of these trainees said that during the COVID-19 outbreak, it was causing them a lack of time to rest, to be able to be available uh, for 24 seven and the procession of being overworked or bent out was felt. And looking at the hospitals, they clearly had different strategies to deal with the workload and the pandemic and not at all times adhering to the accepted working time directives, which is uh, the European working time directive uh, that we focus on uh, across Europe. And and we also asked how the training was going to our trainees and 95% 90 said that their training was affected and mostly negatively. So in 21% of cases, training was interrupted. There, were, there was decrease in educational activities, decrease in number of patients and decrease in the possibilities of required surgical skills. We asked how much decrease they were facing and 63% reported that they had a decrease up to 75% and 15% said they saw the patient contacts decrease even more than 75%. So here uh, to an answer uh, of our question, do you have sufficient exposure to outpatient clinic patients to meet the targets of your training program? As, as we can see, 50%, 54% said that it was insufficient and 23 trainees said that their training was paused. Another question was if, um, what changed with respect to the amount of surgeries that you can perform and if it meets the current goals of your training program. And around 60% said only elective surgeries decreased, but up to 70% said number of surgeries decreased in total. 
And as you can see, again, up to 70% of trainees said that they're not meeting their goals and surgery is insufficient. Only around 6% of trainees said they're meeting their surgery goals as usual. 60% of trainees expressed their concerns about reaching the goals uh, of their OBGYN specialist training program. And we saw that these results were independent from the year, from the stage of their training. Some of the worries were related to uncertainty about their future of their training. And it seemed that, as I mentioned, duration of the training um, was not related and which year they were in was not related, but um, it could influence the degree of their concern. So trainees with a shorter training program, such as for four years, commented more often that they're expecting not to be able to fill the gap that was created by COVID-19 pandemic. Especially in Estonia, it was a, uh, the worries were big because trainees in all specialties have already been told that the duration of their four-year training will not be extended. So here you can see the bars about um, the first on top left, concerns about reaching the goals of OBGYN training due to the pandemic per year of training. As you can see in the seven years or more, um, all trainees had concerns of not meeting their goals in their training. And bottom right, you can see uh, the figure on concerns about reaching the goals of OBGYN specialist training due to the pandemic related to the total duration of training, which is four, five, six, seven years or more. As you can see that a higher amount of concerns were seen in, in trainees that were having four years of training in total. So uh, we asked if our trainees were able to express their con concerns to the head of the department or their trainers. And 67% said that they were able to do so or already had done it. And 58% of these uh, trainees already made arrangements uh, on how to repair the shortcomings of their um, abilities and meeting their program that was caused by the pandemic. And 39% said that they arranged to reassess what they missed and create a, uh, a future plan. Few trainees commented that they were afraid uh, discussing these issues. And some of the trainees also said that discussing would not bring any effect on their training. We also think that such an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary situation can also provide uh, gains and training opportunities. And we asked our trainees if they were able to identify and 30 said they were not able to and six of our trainees said they had extra time to study or do scientific work. So specific competencies gained uh, because of the pandemic was 25% of trainees said they learned organization skills such as crisis management creation of guidelines and protocols, and generally uh, organization of healthcare. And they also said that actively being involved in hospital crisis management, having a seat in the local outbreak management team or other related hospital committees were also gained for them. Um, here you can see the training opportunities experienced by our trainees. And um, as I mentioned, uh, 30 of trainees they couldn't find any but uh, up to 25 percent they had improvement in their organization skills and other fields of medicine science and studying some trainees also gain experience in teleconsultation and conferencing and also flexibility and creativity so um some of the comments that we received from our trainees uh they said they gained knowledge on the health on their national healthcare systems and when they, have, when they were sent to other departments, they learned a lot in other fields of medicine, such as internal, internal medicine intensive care, or about managing pulmonary unstable patients. 9% um, said they had a better understanding of hygiene, transmission of infectious disease, and personal protective measures, improved uh, skills such as flexibility, creativity, and efficiency. And as I already mentioned, they also uh, gained a, and experienced a new way of uh, triage by telehealth, a teleconferencing, and working from home. They also mentioned that these were uh, positive outcomes, according to them, um, that was gained by the pandemic. 
So coming to health and safety, uh, we asked if, if how they perceived their health and safety during the pandemic and social distancing was common to all our trainees across Europe. Only 9% of trainees said it was possible to keep social distance at all times during the hospital. Regulations on how to act when uh, having COVID-19 symptoms was clear to all trainees and PCR testing was uh, accessible for almost all trainees. 59% um, of trainees said they never experienced problems with stocks of uh, PPE. As you can remember, um, the discussion of uh, being available to reach PPE was, uh, was big and had a very uh, influence on European trainees at the beginning of the pandemic. So we asked if they were able to have um, It was related to working with the COVID-19 patients or at all times during the hospital. So percent said they missed PPE. We found out that alarmingly six trainees and five from UK often missed wearing PPE and two trainees said they could never protect themselves. And they also mentioned that generally quality standards of, uh, of care and the quality standards decreased, which was mentioned they were wearing cheaper masks and disposable ma disposables were reused. And previously mandatory protection was not mandatory anymore in specific situations such as attending deliveries. And we also uh, noticed that 20% of our trainees were not trained on how to use PPE properly. So here you can see a figure on personal protective PPE used by trainees. Um, attending deliveries to non-COVID patient versus deliveries of COVID patients. Uh, on light gray, you can see the COVID positive patients, which is uh, higher in almost all cases, but the surgical masks, because we realized that our trainees are using FFP1, two or three masks more common than surgical masks when they're attending non-COVID patients of deliveries. So we asked about headwear, protective glasses, face shields, um, masks, gloves, stereo gloves, uprons, and rubber boots. 50% um, of our trainees, they said that they did not receive any training on treating, how, on treating COVID positive patients. Uh, from on a 10 point scale, we asked if how they felt about the pre uh, preparedness, safety, and health. On the right, you can see the um, one, two, the several countries uh, that um, remarked how, how they uh, feel prepared, safe and health uh, measures were taken. So the ones assigned to COVID uh, wards or ICUs, 38% did not receive educate training and resulting with preparedness, we had average of 5.2 from our trainees. On safety at work, the average answer was 6.4, with Austria being highest as 9.8, and the personal health status was marked as 7.3. So we compared um, a safety at work from trainees from Netherlands and UK, two countries with the most participants to our questionnaire. Here you can see that um, our least satisfied trainees were from UK. And except for Switzerland and UK, our trainees mark sufficient on good health and status. On the bottom, you can see a 10 point Likert scale with a dotted point, it was the Netherlands and a straight um, line was from trainees uh, from UK. We also asked about um, the psychological support for of our trainees and 65% that there was some kind of support uh, from for the personnel uh, at the either develop, either provided by the hospital or the de department. And 14% said that there was no attention to psychoso psychosocial well-being at all. And coming to an end, we also asked about a woman's health, how um, women were able to seek care at their departments and their hospitals during the pandemic. So most of our trainees said the obstetrics care was not affected 
and 47% said that the care was unchanged at all. And 45% said that the departments was accessible uh, for the necessary care in emergencies. Only 2% uh, thought that patients had inadequate access to their department. So family planning, 34% answered that all procedures were canceled and that there was no access at all to family planning. And 43%, the access was decreased because of the pandemic. Coming to benign gynecology, 87% um, said that the departments were less accessible and only open to emergency cases. Um, only five said that their, depart their departments was running and operating as usual. And the other the rest of the trainees said that their department is closed. So reproductive medicine was affected the most. Uh, out of the 103 departments, 58% were closed and 35% reduced their activities. Gynecological oncology. So 57, uh, 56% said they'd not observe any differences in the accessibility of care. 19% um, 19, 19 said women were diagnosed with a delay and 14% said that there was a delay because patients were seeking uh, less medical attention during the pandemic. So there were also longer waiting times for surgery, delaying the start of radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And 24% of trainees thought that therapeutic choices have been influenced by the COVID-19 outbreak. So 41% um, said that the, their department was sufficiently providing care. 29% said it was a little bit lesser than the usual standard of care. And 44% said it was insufficient. But 26% said that their departments were still um, at the highest standards of care, um, for, like, according, to their according to our trainees. So wrapping up, um, due to the pandemic, the training of our uh, European trainees in OBGYN was greatly affected. And the impact of uh, training, um, the impact on training varied per trainee, but issues like workload, exposure to learning opportunities, theoretical education, and training related psychosocial factors were seriously affected. Measures taken to reduce the spread of the pandemic resulted uh, in a decrease uh, to access of women's health care during the pandemic and could, re could result a decrease in quality of women's health care in future if impairment of training cannot be recovered. So we have questions that all should be able to of the pandemic. Every trainee should be able to discuss their concerns with their tutors or their directors and ideally be able to make a plan for the future to complete missing uh, components of their training. Policy making and crisis management on both departmental and hospital level in order to reach their learning objectives. We recommend that lectures and other educational activities should be continued at any times and possibly using virtual platforms. Individually, there may be a need for an elective placement of intensive care or internal, inter, internal medicine in the OBGYN training program. And we also recommend that every trainee should be able to stay safe, safe and healthy during the pandemic. So thank you for listening and we hope that you all stay safe until this pandemic ends. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, I invite all the participants for, for your questions in your question Q&A box, please. Um, and now I want to greet uh, Chipo Wansura, who will be talking about education during the pandemics in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction, Atsiri, and thank you um, to Gokunu for the presentation that makes mine um, a bit more simpler. So I'm going to be talking about the results of the survey, um, pretty much the same one that was um, um, launched by Watog in Europe, but the results within um, Africa. So I'm going to stop sharing. Francesca, can you please share your slides? Yes. Yeah. So next slide. 
So I will give a little bit of background, but my, my task is easy because GOPNU did all the hard work. And then I'll discuss the results of the survey across Africa. Next slide. So as GOPNU said, um, this was the third version of the, of the survey. This one was launched, was launched worldwide by Watub on the 11th of May in 2020. 40 questions similar to the NTOG survey were, uh, were uh, put forward to our trainees and we assessed four aspects, workload, training aspects, the trainees' health and safety and women's and maternal health. And the target were trainees in OBGYN and young obstetricians and gynecologists. As you know, uh, the WATOG caters for trainees from their first year of training to 10 years from the year that they began training. So our cohort included um, trainees within the actual training programs and young consultants in obstetrics and gynecology. Next slide. So we had a low uptake within Africa, only 43 participants, the majority being trainees and nine being um, young obstetrician gynecologists, and the average age was 34 across the total cohort. Next slide. In terms of distribution, uh, most of the trainees were in their third or fourth year of um, training. So this is splitting out the young obstetricians and gynecologists. Next slide. And um, in terms of location, we had feedback from trainees in Nigeria, in uh, Burkina Faso, Kenya, the Republic of South Africa, Sudan, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, where I'm from. Next slide. Among the young obstetricians and gynecologists who responded, as I said, there were nine of them and distributed ac across the countries. Uh, we asked them how long their training had been. The longest um, training program was in Egypt for nine years and the average was four years across the four countries listed there. Next slide. So we asked pretty much the same questions that were launched uh, within the NTOG survey. Uh, we asked them uh, about their workload in comparison with their regular uh, workload. If you look at the, uh, to your extreme left at the trainee graph, um, the, train, the number of hours worked had uh, decreased. So if you um, look towards the left, there were more hours worked during uh, normal uh, periods, and this was slightly reduced during the time of uh, COVID, and this was reflected in the results among the young consultants as well. Next slide. We also posed the question whether they worked from home. The majority worked within the hospital, and that uh, makes sense. Obstetrics and gynecology is a practical um, uh, profession, so most of um, the respondents responded that they actually didn't work from home. A few did, I said that they worked at home and these were mostly the young OBGYNs where we also have, where we have a 50-50 distribution almost between those who work from home and those who are actually working within the hospital. And these make, this makes sense, the so consultants can give um, orders over the form whereas trainees need to be on the ground. Next slide. Um, we also asked the trainees whether they were working on COVID wards. The majority um, st stated that they were not. They stuck to their gynecology or obstetrics um, rotations. Um, but we had two respondents, um, particularly within South Africa, uh, within the South African responses who said they were working on COVID wards and ICU as well. Next slide. We also assess the influence of COVID-19 outbreak on their workload. So if you look at the blue on the pie chart, that's the majority, 44%. Um, so there was a decrease in workload um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but 26% of the respondents actually said that um, there was an increase in the workload um, uh, two percent stated that their hospitals were functioning in emergency mode, and twenty eight percent said the workload was unchanged. Next slide. So we also asked them about whether they were getting time to rest, um, sort of trying to assess their stress levels and whether they were coping. 
the majority of um, the respondents said they were able to get time out to take a lunch break, to have restroom breaks, um, and to have time for a short coffee break. Um, if you are looking at the extreme right at the percentages, but we did have about 16% admitting to being overworked, 33% actually feeling burnt out during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. May you please move to the next slide? We also asked them um, what the effects on the specialist training were that had been brought about by this um, pandemic. And by and large, these were negative sentiments. There was a disruption to programs or rotations throughout their gynecology uh, rotations. Um, in most institutions, academic or morning staff meetings stopped. And um, in our training, these are an important component um, where you actually discuss clinical cases and then you dis uh, discuss the, the theoretical aspects of it and, you know, thrash out um, an, an unusual scenario. So these had stopped. So we had um, a gap in our training. COVID also restricted access of patients to hospitals, therefore decreased patient numbers are seen. As I said, this is a practical specialty and um, you learn more by being exposed to more patients. So this affected training negatively. For a couple, it resulted in delayed examinations um, because there was no one-on-one -on -one contact with patients. There was a delay in the academic year. It put uh, trainees under pressure. And as I said, less practical training Early on within the pandemic, for instance, it was um, stated that um, laparoscopies would, um, laparoscopic procedures were aerosol producing procedures. So um, these were actually stopped initially at our local hospital. I mean, only as people learned lessons on how to deal with the anesthesia and to reduce the aerosol production. Uh, production and where adequate PPE where these re slowly reintroduced. But this had a ne negative impact on training for some uh, trainees. And there was more virtual training, and this was novel and new. Now we are attending webinars and conferences online. Next slide, please. So when we asked about whether um, there was a change in respect to the number of OBGYN patients seen, the majority said there was a 25% decrease to a 25% increase. So there was almost a no, normal distribution to, um, to the extreme right stated that there was a more than 75% increase in patients seen, which is good for exposure, and two said more than a 75% decrease in patients seen, which um, impacted negatively on their training. Next slide, please. So we asked whether they had sufficient outpatient clinic uh, um, exposure to patients and 42% uh, said yes, 42% however said no, and this um, ad, uh, affected their training negatively. Next slide, please. We also posed the question whether there was a change in the amount of surgeries done and 62% said the number of surgeries they were doing had decreased. So this is a negative impact on this um, practical profession. Next slide, please. We asked them whether they were worried and 58% said rightly so, they were worried about their training um, given all these negative impacts that I've mentioned. Next slide. So we asked if there were shortcomings in their training, whether they were able to express their concerns to their professor or head of department. And um, to our relief, at least the majority were able to express their concerns um, to their professor or head of department, and they were able to work out how they would adjust their pro program. Um, but five did say no, they were not able to express their sentiments. Um, so um, this by and large is quite negative. Six said they didn't know. Next slide, please. We asked them where the arrangements had been made if there were shortcomings. And um, the, well, a, a, a large number said no arrangements had been made so far. So if you're looking at the number eight on your screen and um, some stated that they're going to review after the pandemic, uh, the areas that they would have messed up and come up with a plan to resolve um, these issues. Um, Six um, responded that their training had been paused or extended. Um, and 
two stated that COVID-19 care had been added to their curriculum. And I said some trainees had been pulled to work in COVID-19 wards. So there was a temporary shift of focus um, of their training to other areas. Next slide, please. So we also asked them whether time spent during this pandemic would count towards their OBGYN training. The majority um, said yes, and uh, six stated no. Um, one that the academic year had been extended and a few uh, were not sure. Next slide, please. We asked them also whether there was a national strategy to fight COVID-19. By and large, all the countries had a strategy to fight COVID-19. The majority had a partial lockdown, not complete. Um, 10 uh, had a total lockdown. Um, two only had a partial lockdown, um, which had changed to so social distancing. And nine responded that there was only social distancing. Next slide, please. We asked whether it was possible to maintain social distancing within um, their hospitals. 60%, which was the majority, stated that yes, but this wasn't possible when they were examining or treating uh, patients within the labor ward, for instance, or within the operating room. Next slide, please. We also asked them which COVID-19 guideline uh, their hospitals were following. By and large, the majority stated that they were following national guidelines. guidelines. Next slide, please. We asked them whether there were sufficient PPE stocks. Um, unfortunately, the majority said uh, no. Sometimes uh, the personal protective equipment is missing. Um, 10, uh, which was the next highest um, number of trainees, st stated that yes, there were adequate stocks of um, PPE. And um, alarmingly, um, two said they didn't have the required PPE. Six, that PPE was some, sometimes missing. And um, well, there was one participant who hadn't been exposed to COVID-19. So in their hospital, there had been no case of COVID that had been um, diagnosed at the time of the survey. Next slide, please. We asked them also whether they had received uh, PPE training drills. 65% actually stated no, they hadn't received any of um, the PPE training. Next slide, please. We asked them whether they knew um, what to do if they started having symptoms of COVID. Um, 19. The majority um, uh, stated that yes, they knew that they should get tested, um, but they would only go to work if negative, which was good. And uh, 13 also said that yes, and they would stay at home. Um, three said yes, but um, because of the uh, workload, they were still expected at work. Next slide, please. We asked them if personnel were tested at their hospital. Uh, the majority said yes, um, only when in contact with COVID patients. And um, the next highest um, responses were seven who stated that no or regulations on testing are not known or unclear at the time of the survey. And the next highest was six who said yes, they would get tested when requested. Um, only one participant stated that yes, um, personnel were tested routinely at their hospital for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So we asked them if they had been shifted to a COVID ward or ICU, whether they had received training. The majority said um, they hadn't received training. And or, uh, as I said, uh, most only two of the participants, uh, two or three had stated that they had been shifted to other wards. So um, for 32%, this question was not applicable and 19% said yes, they had received um, training. We asked them whether they had received training on managing obstetric COVID-19 patients. 54% marginal majority said that they had received training on how to manage obstetric COVID-19 positive patients. Next slide, please. We also asked them their sentiments on how prepared they felt um, when starting to work with COVID um, patients. As we said, the majority hadn't received patient, um, um, training on managing 
COVID-19 positive patients. So um, it's not alarming that the average score was three on the linked school on that question. We asked them how healthy they felt at this moment. Um, at least most of them felt by and large um, um, healthy. The average score was about eight. And we asked them how they felt, what, uh, how they felt about doing their job during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was an average um, response of five in between completely and feeling completely unsafe and completely safe. Which makes sense given, some in, given that in some units PPE was available and in some PPE wasn't available. Next slide, please. We asked whether psychosocial support was being provided within the hospitals and the majority stated um, no. Next slide, please. And moving to the last section of the survey, we asked um, whether patients had access to obstetric care in their hospitals. And the majority stated that they did have access, but this access had been decreased um, as hospitals were only managing necessary or in, in urgent or emergency cases. For uh, 13, they stated that um, patients' access to obstetric care was unchanged. In terms of access to family planning services, 22 um, uh, trainees stated that this was decreased. So um, at the moment, um, in some centers, that we are seeing quite a number of unplanned pregnancies. And for 17, which was the next highest, this access was unchanged. Next slide, please. We also asked about access to abortion care and the majority, so 20 at the bottom, um, stated that medically indicated abortion care was still provided, followed by um, responses of 18, which, who said um, surgical ab abortions were being performed and 18 where access to abortion care was unchanged. Next slide, please. We also asked about access to reproductive uh, medicine. So this had decreased in the majority of cases. As I stated, most of um, the hospitals were attending to emergencies. So um, getting IVF treatment was, um, is for the patient an emergency, but not necessarily per the national strategy. And in terms of access to general um, benign uh, gynae care, this had um, decreased in the majority um, in gray, 43%, if you're looking at the pie chart on your right. Next slide, please. In terms of effects on gynae oncro care, um, as expected, this was largely negative. Um, if you look at the longest bar chart, 19 responded that patients have had to wait longer for surgery. So this had negative impact um, on management of our oncological patients. Next slide, please. And we also asked about their sentiments on whether given all of this, um, the trainees were providing their usual standard of care to OBGYN patients. And um, the, it, there, there was an equal response between uh, yes and no. So no standard, was less than usual if you look at the blue 36 percent and uh, yes for the 36 percent in gray they were uh, 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 trainees were saying they were providing their usual standard of care despite the pandemic next slide please and uh, that brings to the end my presentation of the africa results uh, gokno's discussion pretty much covered uh, covers the sentiments um, that were raised within the responses to the survey. I'll hand back over to you, Atsiri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hippo, for a brilliant presentation. Um, it was very interesting. I also want to invite all the participants, please, to add any questions to the Q&A box, and we will be gladly answering those at the end of the talks. So now I want to present Dr. Fabiano Serra, he will be presenting the topic education during the pandemics in Latin America. Thank you very much. Here. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very glad with the, the invitation. I'm going to share my screen with you. Well, uh, the topic I was invited to, to tell you is about the education during pandemics in Latin America. Uh, well, I'm Fabiano Lizei Serra, I'm representative of Latin America in Brazil for WATOG. 
So uh, uh, Gokner has uh, presented already how this study was made. So I'm going to, to, to show you the results we had in, in Latin America. First of all, I just wanna show you where Latin America is, is the whole continent under the United States. So it begins on Mexico and goes to the South uh, of uh, America. And just to show the differences between the countries, uh, among the countries, uh, we can see the most uh, uh, language spoken here in Latin America is Spanish, followed by Portuguese, but we have also French and English spoken uh, countries. So because of that, we did Google Forms in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. So the Watog COVID-19 survey was made and we had like 152 responses from Latin America from May to uh, uh, May, uh, from the last year to May this year. Uh, from the responders, uh, most of them were from uh, 24 years old to uh, 29 years old. Most of them, 83% were trainees and uh, we're in the beginning of the residency. So it's the, it were, they were uh, in the first four years of the, of the training. About the, the countries, as you can see, most of the answers were from Mexico, Brazil, but we had a lot of answers uh, from uh, Dominican Republic and Colombia as well. When they were uh, asked about the workload per week, uh, we can see the difference uh, from the workload during pandemics and workload before pandemics. As you can see, the curve uh, were, were uh, decreasing after uh, uh, pandemics, during pandemics. So they had uh, a workload um, uh, bigger than, than uh, after pandemics. When we ask it about the, the workload at the hospital, 50% uh, said it was decreased. 14% uh, said it was unchanged and only 36% said it was increased. About working from home, 64% uh, percent didn't work from home, but 36% yes, they worked from home and 75% less than 20 hours per week. About uh, working at COVID units uh, or ICUs, uh, Few, few uh, trainees uh, did work in COVID, at COVID uh, units. Uh, they were 17%, but only 9% 12 hours and 8% uh, between 12 hours and maximum 24 hours per week. When, uh, when they, they were asked about their routine, routine about resting, uh, um, we could see uh, they had time for restroom breaks at work whenever they needed for 65%. These were, um, this was a, a multiple choice uh, questionnaire. So they could uh, answer the many, the many uh, uh, alternatives they wanted. They, they told they had enough time to rest after work. Uh, they had uh, time for lunch break or snack break at, at work more uh, than... Uh, 53%, 25% said they, they felt burnt out. So it's a lot of uh, people feeling burnt out. And the COVID-19 uh, outbreak had a significant influence on the options they selected. Uh, when uh, anal uh, uh, the analysis was on the effects of uh, on OBGYN specialist training, uh, when asked about the number of patients of patients attended, 48% uh, uh, said it was decreased and 32% said it was increased. 20% uh, was almost unchanged. About the exposure to outpatient clinics patients, 36% uh, uh, was no, it, it was insufficient and no, my training has been paused. So a lot of uh, trainers, trainees said it was uh, uh, insufficient or, or the training had been paused. When they were asked about the surgeries, 54% uh, said the amount of surgeries decreased, 
50% uh, said the amount in elective surgeries decreased, but emergency surgeries stayed the same. Uh, they felt they were not meeting their goals uh, because they were not uh, performing enough surgeries for 48%. Uh, and they told us the situation causes lag in the development of surgical skills for 48% as well. About uh, if they were concerned about the OBGYN specialist training, 77% said it, it was yes, they were concerned. And if, if they had discussed this concern uh, with a professor or supervisor, 62% uh, uh, said yes, it was discussed. And uh, about the arrangements to solve those problems, uh, no arrangements were made so far for 36%. Uh, train, training uh, was paused and, and or the duration of the training would be extended for 24%. 24% uh, would reveal with the professor after the COVID-19 outbreak what they missed and, uh, and then make a plan how to solve the shortcomings. And COVID-19 care uh, was added to, to many training programs as a new target for 17%. Uh, about the learnings, the gains, uh, they, they could answer whatever they wanted. So we had many different answers and most common were knowledge in internal medicine, that's very common with my colleagues as well, uh, about the home classes, how to learn to uh, from home. Uh, they answered they had like now, nowadays expertise in pandemics, uh, with a sentiment of resilience, uh, how to use well the individual protection equipment, the IPE, and uh, about the health and safety and the, the national strategy taken for, uh, for fight against COVID-19, uh, we can see 67% had like a partial lockdown, like schools, bars, restaurants closed, allowed to go outside, but uh, plus social distancing and 23% had total lockdown. Uh, about the social, social distance inside hospital, uh, they told yes, they could have uh, like social distance inside hospital, but not when examining, treating a patient or in their operation room. Uh, the measures to, uh, taken by hospital to keep social distance, uh, the answers, uh, were diversified, but we, we had the 76% uh, told us that there, there were no students anymore or less students. Uh, the maximum amount of visitors uh, to the patients uh, were reduced. Uh, the personnel were reduced as well, and they, they started working from home if possible. And they started putting marks on the floor to keep the social, social distance. About the guideline followed by the hospital, most of them, 46%, uh, were using national guideline and 16% the local guideline. Uh, whether they were using personal protective equipment, the PPEs for the deliveries, uh, the, the most important answers, the difference from a non COVID patient and a COVID patient were, were the N95 mask that increased a lot. Uh, they use of uh, face shield and uh, they use of protective glasses. If they had enough stocks of PPE, that's a good question because Latin America showed that 71% uh, had a shortage of PPE at least sometimes. So only 29% had all the time the sufficient uh, PPE. If they were trained to how to use the PPE, most of them, 51% said no, they were not trained for using them. And only 28% uh, were trained uh, with, a, um, uh, uh, sorry, 21% were, were trained with a hands-on uh, training. If they were trained when, the, when shifted to a COVID ward or ICU, as you can see, 38% uh, said no, they were not trained, 
only 16% said yes, and 46% uh, percent answered that they didn't, um, they haven't shifted uh, to a COVID ward or ICU. Uh, whether they were trained to deal uh, with obstetric COVID patient, 58% said no as well. So we see the training was not very, very good in Latin America for the for deal with those patients. When we checked about the Likert scale for physical and psychological health of the individuals there, where the 10th, uh, closest to the 10th, the healthier the, the person is, we had an average of 6.45. Uh, and how safe working during the COVID outbreak with the same Likert scale, where 10 is the safest they, can, they, they could be, we had an average of 5.41. If they had psychosocial support at hospital or department, as we can see, 37% said yes, we, we, we have uh, at least a bit of support. But 34% said no, not at all. And 29% don't, didn't even know if they had a support. When asked if patients had access to obstetric care, uh, most of them told uh, it was decreased. So 50% said it was decreased, but we had like 24% uh, uh, that said it was increased and 26% that was unchanged. Uh, whether the patients uh, had family planning access, most of them, 80% said it was decreased. The numbers are even higher for reproductive medicine access, where 92% had decreased or had no access to reproductive medicine access. Whether they had uh, general benign gynecological care, uh, most of them, 95% had decreased, uh, had on, only in emergencies or had no access. Uh, about the access to gyne oncology, as we can see, patients had to wait longer for surgery for 30%. Uh, for 26%, therapeutic choices were influenced by the COVID-19 outbreak and treatment plans uh, were different because of the situation. There was no access to gynecology at all for 25% of the, 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 the services of the residents of, of the trainees they, they, uh, that answered the questionnaire. For 24%, the diagnosis uh, was delayed. So we see it's an important issue for gynecology as well in Latin America. Uh, when asked if they were um, happy, if, if they could still provide the usual standard of, uh, of care to their OBGYN patients, most of them said yes, they could still provide the standard uh, care but 40% said no, it's an important number as well. So as conclusions of the study in Latin America, what we have is a decrease in the workload during pandemics with increasing working from home, with, a, with a, a difficult to keep social distance at hospital and uh, few were trained to work on COVID units or ICU, uh, so some of them uh, felt uh, really unprepared to be on, the, on those places. An important issue as well was the lack of personal protective equipment, the PPEs, and few training for using them. They were not trained, they're not trained as well for uh, attending patients with COVID-19. So uh, uh, it does, it's a problem as well. It was a high decrease in patients, patients attended, mainly in family planning, reproductive medicine, general uh, benign gynecology and gyneco-oncology. And most of the trainees uh, were really worried about their training and how the future would be. 
I just like to thank you and I'm here for any other question you have. Thank you for the committee for inviting me. Thank you very much, Professor Fabiano Serra. Uh, and thank you very much to all of our um, panelists who did an excellent job in presenting the statistics regarding this very interesting survey. And we do have uh, a couple of questions. So I would ask all our panelists to please switch on their camera. Um, many of them can be answered by many of you. But uh, I first would like to ask a question because I would like to tell everyone that this um, survey began in Europe. It was actually the, the pioneers of the survey were the ENTOC, um, the European um, Trainee uh, Association organization, and they had the idea of the survey. So I wanted to ask you, Governor, a little bit more. Could you, could you answer us, how did the idea came to you or how did you guys decide to talk or to perform this survey? Where did the idea came from? Um, thank you, Atsuri, uh, for your question. Well, uh, this idea came up last year in the beginning of, of the pandemic, uh, because in we were also we were also trainees, and I think it was end of March or beginning of April, we realized that um, there is something going on that we have no idea about, and for the first time in our lives, the world just closed down. And uh, we were also asked to wear um, PPEs. And we were also told that uh, there is an infectious disease that's going on. And a lot of um, procedures or outpatient clinics start to close down. And we were, you know, we were started to uh, be put down and monitored in COVID units. So we realized that our training is going to be affected because we're not just OBGYN trainees anymore as of all of us, all the trainees in our hospitals, we were working um, as doctors now uh, and um, not just OBGYN, but in infectious diseases and internal medicine. And then we decided to learn how the situation is throughout Europe, because also due to the lack of communication uh, with uh, the scaredness and anxiety that happened, we started, we started to wonder how it's going in other countries. So we decided to um, uh, do a survey and have a better understanding of the situation. And also as NTOG, uh, we thought we could um, share the results and maybe have a positive effect on how our trainees achieve their goals to uh, meet you know, their expectations at the end of the training. So this grew out. And, and then as you and Watok also um, wanted to do this in worldwide, which was amazing. And now we have results from all over the countries and continents. And we, I think we have a better understanding of the pandemic effects on OBGYN training. That is so true. I think that we, at the beginning, we thought like maybe there will be a, a solution, but in some of the countries we saw that it changed completely the training. And it is very unfortunate because some of the countries as appeared by the, by the results that you have presented in their surveys have not undertaken any solutions or any real solutions that will uh, make up for the time that was not lost, but one could say change or modified. So thank you very much because I think it's a very interesting survey. And um, I wanted to ask this question for example, um, to any of the of, of the panelists, let's say to Chipo, what would these surveys tell us about OBD1 and training differs from other clinical training experiences? This question does not really ex express what other clinical training experiences, but perhaps OBGYN training compared to medical students, or did the OBGYN training had different things regarding other types of medical uh, training experiences? I, this survey wasn't performed, but for only OBGYN, it wasn't really performed for physiotherapies or other um, specialties. This survey was only done for OBGYN. I want to clarify that um, before. But what do you think, um, Chipo? What do you think, for for example, in your experience, did you see any other differences between the OBGYN trainees and other specialties, or did you see any other differences between the OBGYN trainees and medical students? Did you see anything different? Thank you for the question. 
So as you rightly said, this was a survey among OBGYN trainees, and I am not aware of any survey among the other clinical disciplines that include medicine, surgery, um, pediatrics. I can only make inferences. Um, to my mind, obstetrics and gynecology is a very practical um, discipline. You need to learn how to do cesarean sections, deliveries, how to do diagnostic laparoscopies, um, total laparoscopic hysterectomies, etc. You need to be hands-on. And in order to diagnose some of the conditions, you actually need to examine the patient. Um, it, it's very rare that a patient would present with symptoms and without examining them, maintaining your social distance, be able to come up with a diagnosis. So um, from the perspective of it being an, a practical um, profession, I would only be able to draw comparisons with other surgical disciplines like surgery, for instance, and maybe say these results um, could, could be um, applied across the board. Um, but to then make a conclusion and to make uh, 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 conclusions about whether it does um, differ from other clinical training experiences, I am not sure. Perhaps my colleagues can also give their input. Does any of you have any other input on this uh, question? Do you think it will be fair something um, something with the with the other clinical um, ex training experiences? Well, I think uh, the, the the training for OBGYN uh, ha had um, a lower impact when compared to clinical things. For example. Uh, uh, people that had only, only ambulatory things to, to see patients, out clinic patients, so they don't have surgeries. So their, trainer, trainees, uh, uh, their training uh, was even worse, I think. That's the comparison we have here in Brazil. Okay, great. Um, we have another question also that it says, um, thank you very much. Um, and. What should psychosocial support for trainees look like? Is it done successfully anywhere? Um, and this comes for all the speakers. So I would like to get first the input from Professor Dogner from Europe. Um, what is it? Do you know about any psychosocial support programs that are being held, for example, in Europe? And is, are they done successfully? Um, thank you for the question. And I'd like to mention in, in some departments, uh, there were psychologists uh, who were uh, trainees could able to go and talk to. As we already mentioned, the stress factor during the pandemic has affected trainees a lot. Uh, some of the trainees also mentioned in the comments that even though workload decreased, but the stress factor felt, uh, made them feel like their workload had increased. So I think it is important uh, to have psychological support, especially for stress management. And not only our professional lives, but also in our personal lives, uh, we need to have some support during uh, the, the pandemic and stressful times, I believe. And I think it is a crucial support that all of us needed uh, during the pandemic. Um, I personally can say I had uh, enough uh, support from my department, uh, but for other departments, I can't specifically say if they were uh, enough or not, but as our trainees said, they, they had psychological support and they were happy about it. Great, thank you very much. How about in Africa, Chipo? Did you, were you aware of any, any, any programs for psychosocial support? Um, I, I found that to be an interesting question because um, uh, personally, I didn't have access. Um, interesting, Gokno, that you actually have psychologists on standby. I think it's an aspect that is neglected, maybe in some of our training facilities. I cannot speak for the rest of Africa, um, but definitely I, I, I know I don't have a standby psychologist. Um, for our department, I, we do have access to mentors um, whom we can meet and discuss um, these issues with. But as you know, COVID-19 affected everyone. And so um, pretty much everyone <laughs> will be having some form of um, post-traumatic stress um, disorder after it all and uh, during uh, the, the time. So I, I think um, it's an important point raised 
is something that we probably need to be very deliberate about when we are coming, about, coming up with our training programs to ensure that we are providing the trainee with support. I, I know our labor wards, our, uh, our, our, our training is actually quite hectic. During our calls, we deal with so many um, patients, but to say that there is a formal method of support, um, it's not there. You, there's peer-to-peer -peer support, where you're speaking to your colleagues, um, but other than that, there's no formal program uh, where I am training. Thank you very much, Ipo. It sounds unfortunate, but I think that it does vary among, even among the same country in, inside different places where they say one hospital to another hospital and not only among the countries, but in among the regions that we're presenting. But yeah, unfortunately, um, we had some questions that explored this when we asked, do you feel burnout? And unfortunately, we saw that there were a lot of trainees that did feel burnout. So Fabiano, could you give us a little bit of the insight of what happened in Latin America? Do you know about any support programs that were held to support um, trainees? Well, not, not exactly a support program. I couldn't see that. But we could see at hospitals and departments some uh, psychologists working with uh, the trainees uh, and the, the same uh, uh, with a psychiatrist because uh, some people with the burnout uh, increasing, they, they needed tra treatment as well, medicines for, for dealing with uh, the depression and burning out and all this stuff that appeared. Uh, so, uh, but it differs a lot between the, the, the hospitals between the cities, the whole country, the whole continent. So it's totally different. And what we see is that um, they, they have to look for help by themselves. So they have to go to the private uh, specialist to solve their problems. That's, that's what we saw a lot. Yeah, that is very sad that we didn't, that a lot of countries and a lot of programs didn't have a formal um, psychosocial support. I could say that in my hospital, for example, in Mexico, we did have a psychology department which had a meeting weekly with the trainees. Um, and obviously the, the, the invitation was open, but I did see that the psychological um, support systems were also overloaded. So there was a lot of personnel, I mean, nursing staff. So it wasn't enough, the, the amount of psychosocial support that was required. So we did see that at least in Mexico in my hospital. So I do think that it's very important that we have to keep in mind, and I think that we have to keep in mind about these support systems being um, standardized or at least that have enough reach to include all the trainees. Um, another question that we have here is, is it mandatory to vaccinate all health workers or trainees before put in any COVID-19 duty? So something that is very important is that this uh, survey was done before there was a COVID vaccine. So it wasn't included in the survey. It's important to say that, but I would like to have, um, for example, the input, we have three representatives from different regions. So governor, what can you tell us about the situation in Europe? Um, about vaccination, thank you, Adjuri. Uh, in most of the countries, uh, all healthcare workers, OBGYN trainees are uh, already vaccinated. And um, so I think it's crucial for all of the world to be vaccinated now so we can try to go back to normal. And I think the numbers are good uh, in Europe. Great, how about in Africa, Chipo? So we have a mixed picture picture, um, partly because we were not affected um, as much as the rest of, uh, well, as much as Europe, for instance, at the beginning of the pandemic last year, um, we only started getting uh, much of the negative effects in the second wave from about December. Um, and some countries haven't even gotten to the third wave. Um, in terms of vaccinations, as you said, rightly, last year, there were no vaccinations. Our vaccines were rolled out this year. Um, first, initially for the healthcare workers. I know it's a similar situation within South Africa, um, but as you know, there isn't any, um, well, not all countries in Africa have the vaccine to start with. Um, it's been, we are developing countries, so it's got issues to do with access. We are importing these uh, vaccines from Europe, from Asia, um, that sort of thing. So it takes a while for everything to, to, to come down. 
to Africa. But I can say that where the vaccines are present, healthcare workers are getting vaccinated. Yeah, well, hopefully it will arrive soon to all the countries in Africa. And what about Latin America, Fabiano? Can you tell us the situation, well, particularly in Brazil, where you are? Yeah, it's difficult to say about the whole Latin America as it was not on the questionnaire. But uh, in Brazil, all the health workers and trainees are vaccinated ar already. Uh, it was the first group to be vaccinated, actually. Uh, so as soon as, as the vaccination started here in Brazil, it started with the health workers and the, the trainees. Uh, with conversation uh, uh, among my colleagues from other countries, I can see uh, almost all, all countries uh, had been vaccinated, the, the health workers and the trainees as well. Uh, some of them uh, had a delay on the starting, uh, on starting the vaccination, but uh, nowadays I think everyone is vaccinated already. Great. Well. Hopefully we'll get everybody vaccinated because we know that in the beginning it was also difficult, for example, in the case of Mexico to get trainees vaccinated. Unfortunately, for some governments, trainees and medical professionals were not a priority, even though the WHO said that they were the priority, but it depends a lot on the government and the situation of the government as well. Um, we have another question from the audience. It says, I am from Bangladesh, I'm same condition here. We really need some, well, it's more like a commentary. We really need some solutions for our trainees and interns. Um, and actually there's a question here, Professor Faisal, I will put you on the spot here. What are the specific recommendations by FIGO to overcome the situation? Do you have a comment on that? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the amazing participants have covered a lot of things and survey was amazing. I want everybody to know that as FIGO with all with, with, with like 2 million probably gynecologists all over the world, we are all under this pandemic and we're facing a lot of challenge. Well, as far as FIGO is concerned, we have started the educational component over the past year. We had more than 34, 35 uh, FIGONARs by now, reaching thousands and thousands of, of colleagues. We are producing frequently uh, statements, uh, guidelines, uh, uh, practice bulletins, advice, uh, and all our webinars and figurinars are practice oriented. This is gonna be very difficult. Uh, we have also a specific recommendation uh, to certain programs, as uh, Fabiano said, uh, and the others, it will be very possible for none hands-on, but when it comes to hands-on uh, experiences, of course, many of the surgeries, uh, many of the cold, what we call cold surgeries, uh, had been postponed. Even in the earlier days, we have no idea about closed circuits, about aerosol transmission, and so on and so forth. It's going to be very difficult. We have to rely so much on telehealth uh, and on uh, tele-educational uh, activities. And uh, hopefully uh, things will get better uh, with the vaccination and uh, it will ease and we'll go back to our uh, training and capacity building and skill building. And FIGO will be, uh, as always, uh, leading on this and happy uh, to have any suggestions or any uh, uh, feedback uh, to interfere uh, anywhere in the global regions of FIGO. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I would last ask every uh, participant, every of the panelists to give just one, less than one minute, one statement. What would be the last idea that you guys want everyone in this group to, to keep in mind? Um, Governor? Um, thank you everyone once again, and thank you to all participants. Um, I really hope that uh, this pandemic had some positive effects on us. And at the end, I hope to see everyone who wants a more for training um, can do so and meet their requirements. And I hope that all the trainees in OBGYN to stay safe. Thank you. Great. Chibo? Thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. 
I think that um, by and large, some of the sentiments were quite negative in terms of how COVID-19 affected um, our training. Um, but I think that what we should take away is at least we've identified um, the deficiencies and areas that we need to work on. Co I mean, COVID-19 has taught us to have um, um, conferences virtually. So it's just making us rethink all our strategies for training and everything to do with our lives. So I think that's my key takeaway. Um, let's pull on the positive. Thank you very much, Fabiano. Well, I just want to say that they uh, to don't be afraid of talking to the supervisor and professor about your training program, because this is the only way you can find a solution for, for being uh, well prepared for your future. So uh, uh, be hopeful and uh, be vaccinated. So I think uh, everything is going to be all right in the future soon. On my behalf, I want to thank you all for your participation and all the panelists for your brilliant um, presentations. And I want to thank Figo for the opportunity for exposing this survey that hopefully will soon be published. Um, and we are very grateful for everyone to be here. Thank you, Professor Faisal, for the invitation. And I leave you for the conclusion. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, thank you for uh, the collaboration. Uh, it is a great honor and pleasure for Figo to have you. And uh, I think uh, we have learned a lot from the survey. I would encourage everybody to stay tuned to our figurars and to stay tuned to all the telehealth and teleeducation. This is gonna be part of our future, gonna be part of the training and there is a lot to learn. And as Fabiano said, don't be afraid. Uh, everything can be made up of and imagine yourself now in another track, on another page, we're all learning and we are all uh, benefiting, and I think uh, it's gonna uh, show up uh, in the future. Stay tuned with Figo and with Watog, stay safe, and thank you very much, everybody.